What mysteries of the universe could the world's largest and most powerful particle accelerator unlock? The Large Hadron Collider, or LHC, at CERN has just marked the official start of the 2024 physics data-taking season. In the 14 years since it was first turned on, the Particle Accelerator has explored some of the biggest mysteries in the universe, colliding countless particles at near the speed of light in a tunnel 328 feet underground. One of the most amazing things about the LHC is that scientists don't know exactly what might happen when they smash protons together at nearly the speed of light. Despite its years of driving groundbreaking science, at the end of Run 2 in 2018, scientists estimated that the LHC had only delivered about 3% of the data expected in its lifetime. And it's just getting started. There are some major mysteries in the universe that scientists hope to answer, and the LHC could be instrumental in some of that progress. And in a recent revelation, the Large Hadron Collider has just yielded some extraordinary and perplexing results, hinting evidence of a breakthrough that physics has been waiting decades for, a brand new physics. Join us as we dig deep into CERN's chilling new discovery that changes everything. Let's start with a quick look at the world's largest particle collider, a marvel of modern particle physics that has enabled researchers to plumb the depths of reality. The origins of the LHC stretch all the way back to 1977, when Sir John Adams, the former director of CERN, suggested building an underground tunnel that could accommodate a particle accelerator capable of reaching extraordinarily high energies, according to a 2015 history paper by physicist Thomas Scherner Sedenius. The project was officially approved 20 years later, in 1997, and construction began on the ring that passed beneath the French-Swiss border capable of accelerating particles up to 99.99% the speed of light and smashing them together. Within the ring, 9,300 magnets guide packets of charged particles in two opposite directions at a rate of 11,245 times a second, finally bringing them together for a head-on collision. The facility is capable of creating around 600 million collisions every second, spewing out incredible amounts of energy and every once in a while, an exotic and never-before-seen heavy particle. The LHC operates at energies 6.5 times higher than the previous record-holding particle accelerator, Fermilab's decommissioned Tevatron in the US. The LHC cost a total of $8 billion to build, $531 million of which came from the United States. More than 8,000 scientists from 60 different countries collaborate on its experiments. The accelerator first switched on its beams on September 10, 2008, colliding particles at only a 10 millionth of its original design intensity. It turned off in 2018 for upgrades and switched on again on April 22, 2022, with higher power and double the collision rate. The goal is to ramp up the energy of the collisions to a record-breaking 13.6 tera electron volts. Before it began operations, there were fears that the new atom smasher would destroy Earth, perhaps by creating an all-consuming black hole. But any reputable physicist would state that such worries are unfounded. In the words of CERN Director General Robert Amer, the LHC is safe, and any suggestion that it might present a risk is pure fiction. That's not to say the facility couldn't potentially be harmful if used improperly. If you were to stick your hand in the beam, which focuses the energy of an aircraft carrier in motion down to a width of less than a millimeter, it would make a hole right through it, and then the radiation in the tunnel would kill you. Over the last 10 years, the LHC has smashed atoms together for its two main experiments, ATLAS and CMS which operate and analyze their data separately. This is to ensure that neither collaboration is influencing the other and that each provides a check on their sister experiment. The instruments have generated more than 2,000 scientific papers on many areas of fundamental particle physics. On July 4, 2012, the scientific world watched with bated breath as researchers at the LHC announced the discovery of the Higgs boson the final puzzle piece in a five-decade-old theory 
called the Standard Model of Physics. The Standard Model tries to account for all known particles and forces, except gravity, and their interactions. Back in 1964, British physicist Peter Higgs wrote a paper about the particle that now bears his name, explaining how mass arises in the universe. The Higgs is actually a field that permeates all of space and drags on every particle that moves through it. Some particles trudge more slowly through the field, and this corresponds to their larger mass. Nicknamed the God Particle, the Higgs boson is a manifestation of this field, which physicists had been chasing after for half a century. The LHC was explicitly built to finally capture this elusive quarry. Eventually, finding that the Higgs had 125 times the mass of a proton, both Peter Higgs and Belgian theoretical physicist François Englert were awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2013 for predicting its existence. Even with the Higgs in hand, physicists can't rest because the standard model still has some holes. For one, it doesn't deal with gravity, which is mostly covered by Einstein's theories of relativity. It also doesn't explain why the universe is made of matter and not antimatter, which should have been created in roughly equal amounts at the beginning of time. And it is entirely silent on dark matter and dark energy, which had yet to be discovered when it was first created. Before the LHC turned on, many researchers would have said that the next great theory is one known as supersymmetry, which adds similar but much more massive twin partners to all known particles. One or more of these heavy partners could have been a perfect candidate for the particles making up dark matter. And supersymmetry begins to get a handle on gravity, explaining why it is so much weaker than the other three fundamental forces. That's why prior to the Higgs discovery, the original hope of many was that the most powerful particle accelerator in human history would reveal something slightly different than what the standard model predicted, hinting at new physics. The way it does so is brilliant. By producing large numbers of high-energy collisions, exotic, unstable particles are created in great numbers. Those events are then tracked and recorded by the world's largest particle detectors, identifying the energy, momentum, electric charges, and many other properties of everything that comes out. If the standard model, all of its particles and interactions, were legitimately all that were out there, we could calculate precisely what we'd see. There would be new particles created with particular probabilities that corresponded to the particular parameters of each collision. The new particles that came into existence would then decay in a particular set of ways, with particular lifetimes, into sets of particles that are permitted, with particular ratios, and not into other groups of particles which are forbidden, all according to the standard model's rules. What scientists basically doing is testing the standard model to incredible precision and looking for any possible deviations. Unfortunately, most of the ideas they initially examined didn't pan out at the LHC. The Higgs isn't a composite particle. There are no low-energy, supersymmetric particles. The evidence for large or warped extra dimensions isn't there. And there appears to be just one Higgs particle instead of many. But that doesn't mean everything we've seen is in perfect agreement with the standard model's predictions. Anytime you collide large numbers of particles at high energies, you're going to create heavy, rare, unstable particles, so long as they're allowed by Einstein's most famous equation, E equals mc squared. Those particles will live for a short while and then decay. If you can create enough of them, you can actually test the standard model with some level of mathematical rigor. Because there are explicit predictions for how often any particle you create should decay in a particular fashion, measuring the frequency of these decays precisely by creating enormous numbers of these particles puts the standard model to the test. And there are many, many ways that we genuinely believe physics must somehow go beyond the standard model. For example, Gravity is not treated as a quantum interaction, but rather as a classical, unchanging background by the standard model. Neutrinos are predicted to be massless by the standard model, and there's no dark matter nor dark energy. 
The standard model doesn't explain everything we see about our universe, and we fully anticipate that, at some level, there may be additional fields, particles, interactions, dimensions, or even physics from beyond our observable universe that could be affecting us. Back in 2017, the LHC surpassed a major milestone when they had put over 200 petabytes of data permanently into its tape libraries. To put this amount of data into perspective, one petabyte of data is equivalent to around 250,000 movies. But what are they looking for in all this data anyway? They notice something going on with a particular kind of quark. As told, the standard model describes nature on the smallest of scales, comprising fundamental particles known as leptons, such as electrons, and quarks, which can come together to form heavier particles such as protons and neutrons and the forces they interact with. There are many different kinds of quarks, some of which are unstable and can decay into other particles. The new result relates to an experimental anomaly that was first hinted at in 2014, when LHC beauty physicists spotted beauty quarks decaying in unexpected ways. Specifically, beauty quarks appeared to be decaying into leptons called muons, less often than they decayed into electrons. This is strange because the muon is in essence a carbon copy of the electron, identical in every way, except that it's around 200 times heavier. You would expect beauty quarks to decay into muons just as often as they do to electrons. The only way these decays could happen at different rates is if some never-before-seen particles were getting involved in the decay and tipping the scales against muons. While the 2014 result was intriguing, it wasn't precise enough to draw a firm conclusion. Since then, a number of other anomalies have appeared in related processes. They have all individually been too subtle for researchers to be confident that they were genuine signs of new physics, but tantalizingly, they all seem to be pointing in a similar direction. The big question was whether these anomalies would get stronger as more data was analyzed or melt away into nothing. In 2019, LHCB performed the same measurement of beauty quark decay again, but with extra data taken in 2015 and 2016. But things weren't much clearer than they'd been five years earlier. Recent result doubles the existing data set by adding the sample recorded in 2017 and 2018. To avoid accidentally introducing biases, the data was analyzed blind. The scientists couldn't see the result until all the procedures used in the measurement had been tested and reviewed. Mitesh Patel, a particle physicist at Imperial College London and one of the leaders of the experiment, described the excitement he felt when the moment came to look at the result. I was actually shaking. I realized this was probably the most exciting thing I've done in my 20 years in particle physics. When the result came up on the screen, the anomaly was still there. Around 85 muon decays for every 100 electron decays, but with a smaller uncertainty than before. What will excite many physicists is that the uncertainty of the result is now over 3 sigma. Scientists' way of saying that there is only around a one in a thousand chance that the result is a random fluke of the data. Conventionally, particle physicists call anything over three sigma evidence. However, we are still a long way from a confirmed discovery or observation. That would require five sigma. Theorists have shown it is possible to explain this anomaly and others by recognizing the existence of brand new particles that are influencing the ways in which the quarks decays. One possibility is a fundamental particle called a Z-prime, in essence, a carrier of a brand new force of nature. This force would be extremely weak, which is why we haven't seen any signs of it until now and would interact with electrons and muons differently. Another option is the hypothetical leptoquark, a particle that has the unique ability to decay to quarks and leptons simultaneously and could be part of a larger puzzle that explains why we see the particles that we do in nature. So have we finally seen evidence of new physics? Well, maybe, maybe not. We do a lot of measurements at the LHC, so you might expect at least some of them to fall this far from the standard model. 
and we can never totally discount the possibility that there's some bias in our experiment that we haven't properly accounted for, even though this result has been checked extraordinarily thoroughly. Ultimately, the picture will only become clearer with more data. Either way, searching for new particles isn't just a matter of being creative with the hardware, it's also a software problem. While it's running, the LHC generates about a petabyte of collision data per second, a veritable fire hose of information. Less than 1% of that gets saved, explains Ben Nachman, a data physicist at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. We just can't write a petabyte per second to tape right now. Dealing with that data will only become more important in the coming years as the LHC receives its high luminosity upgrade. Starting at the end of the decade, the high luminosity LHC will operate at the same energy, but it will record about 10 times more data than the LHC has accumulated so far. The boost will come from an increase in beam density. Stuffing more protons into the same space leads to more collisions, which translates to more data. As the frame fills with dozens of collisions, the detector begins to look like a Jackson Pollock painting with splashes of particles that are impossible to disentangle. To handle the increasing data load and search for new physics, particle physicists are borrowing from other disciplines like machine learning and math. There's a lot of room for creativity and exploration, and really just kind of thinking very broadly, says Jessica Howard, a phenomenologist at the University of California, Santa Barbara. One of Howard's projects involves applying optimal transport theory, an area of mathematics concerned with moving stuff from one place to the next, to particle detection. The field traces its roots to the 18th century when the French mathematician Gaspard Monge was thinking about the optimal way to excavate Earth and move it. Conventionally, the shape of a particle collision, roughly, the angles at which the particles fly out, has been described by simple variables. But using tools from optimal transport theory, Howard hopes to help detectors be more sensitive to new kinds of particle decays that have unusual shapes and better able to handle the high luminosity LHC's higher rates of collisions. As with many new approaches, there are doubts and kinks to work out. It's a really cute idea, but I have no idea what it's useful for at the moment. Nachman says of optimal transport theory. He is a proponent of novel machine learning approaches, some of which, he hopes, will allow researchers to do entirely different kinds of searches and look for patterns that we couldn't have otherwise found. Though particle physicists were early adopters and have been using machine learning since at least the early 1990s, the past decade of advances in deep learning has dramatically changed the landscape. The energy of particle colliders, as measured by the combined energy of two colliding particles, has risen over the decades, opening up new realms of physics to explore. In the words of Javier Duarte, an experimentalist at the University of California, San Diego, machine learning can almost always improve things. In a hunt for needles in haystacks, the ability to change the signal-to-noise ratio is crucial. Unless physicists can figure out better ways to search, more data might not help much. It might just be more hay. One of the most notable but understated applications for this kind of work is refining the picture of the Higgs. About 60% of the time, the Higgs boson decays into a pair of bottom quarks. Bottom quarks are tricky to find amid the mess of debris in the detectors. So researchers had to study the Higgs through its decays into an easy-to-spot photon pair, even though that happens only about 0.2% of the time. But in the span of a few years, machine learning has dramatically improved the efficiency of bottom quark tagging, which allows researchers another way to measure the Higgs boson. Ten years ago, people thought this was impossible, Duarte says. The Higgs boson is of central importance to physicists because it can tell them about the Higgs field, the phenomenon that gives mass to all the other elementary particles. Even though some properties of the Higgs boson have been well studied, like its mass, others, like the recursive way it interacts with itself, 
remain unknown with any kind of precision. Measuring those properties could rule out, or confirm, theories about dark matter and more. What's truly exciting about machine learning is its potential for a completely different class of searches called anomaly detection. The Higgs is kind of the last thing that was discovered where we really knew what we were looking for, Duarte says. Researchers want to use machine learning to find things they don't know to look for. In anomaly detection, researchers don't tell the algorithm what to look for. Instead, they give the algorithm data and tell it to describe the data in as few bits of information as possible. Currently, anomaly detection is still nascent and hasn't resulted in any strong hints of new physics, but proponents are eager to try it out on data from the High Luminosity LHC. Because anomaly detection aims to find anything that is sufficiently out of place, physicists call this style of search model agnostic. It doesn't depend on any real assumptions. Not everyone is fully on board. Some theorists worry that the approach will only yield more false alarms from the collider, more tentative blips in the data, like two sigma bumps, so named for their low level of statistical certainty. These are generally flukes that eventually disappear with more data and analysis. Corin is concerned that this will be even more the case with such an open-ended technique. It seems they want to have a machine that finds more two sigma bumps at the LHC. Nachman said that he received a lot of pushback. He says one senior physicist told him, if you don't have a particular model in mind, you're not doing physics. Searches based on specific models, he says, have been amazingly productive. He points to the discovery of the Higgs boson as a prime example, but they don't have to be the end of the story. Let the data speak for themselves, he says. One thing particle physicists would really like in the future is more precision. The problem with protons is that each one is actually a bundle of quarks. Smashing them together is like a subatomic food fight, ramming indivisible particles like electrons and their antiparticles, positrons, into one another results in much cleaner collisions, like the ones that take place on a pool table. Without the mess, researchers can make far more precise measurements of particles like the Higgs. An electron-positron collider would produce so many Higgs bosons so cleanly that it's often referred to as a Higgs factory. But there are currently no electron-positron colliders that have anywhere near the energies needed to probe the Higgs. One possibility on the horizon is the future circular collider. It would require digging an underground ring with a circumference of 55 miles, three times the size of the LHC in Switzerland. That work would likely cost tens of billions of dollars, and the collider would not turn on until nearly 2050. There are two other proposals for nearer-term electron-positron colliders in China and Japan, but geopolitics and budgetary issues, respectively, make them less appealing prospects. Physicists would also like to go to higher energies. It will be nearly impossible to do so with electrons. Because they have such a low mass, they radiate away about a trillion times more energy than protons every time they loop around a collider. But under CERN's plan, the future circular collider tunnel could be repurposed to collide protons at energies eight times what's possible in the LHC about 50 years from now. It's completely scientifically sound and great, Hommeler says. I think that CERN should do it. Could we get to higher energies faster? In December, the alliteratively named Particle Physics Project Prioritization Panel put forward a vision for the near future of the field. In addition to addressing urgent priorities like continued funding for the high-luminosity LHC upgrade and plans for telescopes to study the cosmos, Particle Physics Project Prioritization Panel also recommended pursuing a Moonshot, an ambitious plan to develop technology to collide muons. The idea of a muon collider has tantalized physicists because of its potential to combine both high energies and, since the particles are indivisible, clean collisions. It seemed well out of reach until recently, 
Mun's decay in just 2.2 microseconds, which makes them extremely hard to work with. However, over the past decade, researchers have made strides, showing that, among other things, it should be possible to manage the roiling cloud of energy caused by decaying muons as they're accelerated around the machine. Advocates of a muon collider also tout its smaller size, about 10 miles. Its faster timeline, optimistically as early as 2045, and the possibility of a U.S. site, specifically Fermi National Laboratory, about 50 miles west of Chicago. However, Note that there are plenty of caveats. A muon collider still faces serious technical, financial, and political hurdles. And even if it is built, there is no guarantee it will discover hidden particles. But especially for younger physicists, the panel's endorsement of muon collider R&D is more than just a policy recommendation. It is a bet on their future. As Homeller says, this is exactly what we were hoping for. This opens a pathway to having this exciting, totally different frontier of particle physics in the U.S. It's a frontier he and others are keen to explore. In addition, in a significant revelation, physicists at the Large Hadron Collider are closing in on an explanation for why we live in a universe of matter and not antimatter. Matter and antimatter are two sides of the same coin. Every type of particle has an antiparticle, which is its equal and opposite. For instance, the antimatter equivalent of a negatively charged electron is a positively charged positron. The standard model of physics tells us that if we substitute a particle for its antiparticle, it should still operate within the laws of physics in the same way. As such, the Big Bang should not have had a preference for creating one type over another. This symmetry at the heart of nature means that matter and antimatter should have formed in equal amounts in the Big Bang. Lucky for us, this does not seem to have been the case, because when you put matter and antimatter together, the outcome is explosive to say the least. Had matter and antimatter been crafted in equal amounts, then they would have annihilated each other, creating a cosmos filled with a sea of radiation, no atoms and no life. Today, the only antimatter is that which is produced in particle decays and interactions. However, physicists still don't have an explanation for why we are so fortunate. The fact that there's an excess of matter in the universe means that, somewhere along the line, the symmetry in the way that matter and antimatter interact with the laws of physics was broken. Physicists call this symmetry breaking a charge conjugation parity, or CP, violation. One way to envisage it is to consider the rotational symmetry of a particle. Quantum physics theory holds that particles are not solid objects, but rather strange little bodies that act like waves along a wave function. Ordinarily, when you spin that wave function around 360 degrees, the properties of the particle should not change. But when there is a CP violation, the properties of some particles can change. For instance, their quantum spin can alter from 1, 2 to 1, 2. CP violation is known to take place in the weak force, which is the fundamental force that is responsible for radioactive decay inside atoms. So we know it can happen. Although the weak force example is a different CP violation than the one that could have possibly created the matter-antimatter imbalance. However, in 2013, scientists working on the LHCb experiment also detected CP violation in the decay of beauty mesons and strange beauty mesons, in which the matter and antimatter versions of these particles behave differently when they decay. The atoms in our bodies are made of protons and neutrons, which themselves are made of three smaller particles called quarks. Physicists call particles made of three quarks baryons. Particles made of two quarks, one quark and one antiquark, are called mesons, and they tend to decay quickly. Beauty is another name for the bottom quark, while strange refers to a strange quark. The names are just for descriptive purposes, to differentiate quarks with slightly different properties and are not to be taken literally. Now, 
Analysis of new and more comprehensive results from the LHC experiment has measured more precisely than ever before the two most important parameters in the CP violating decay of these mesons. As LHCB spokesperson Chris Parks said in a statement, these are key parameters that aid our search for unknown effects from beyond our current theory. Probing the decay of approximately 349,000 mesons, the LHCB team measured the angle at which the particles that come from the decay of the mesons were emitted and the time taken for the mesons to decay. Both properties vary, depending on whether the meson is a matter or antimatter particle. In particular, the time taken for a meson to decay, which is on the scale of tenths of a nanosecond, is dependent on the quantum state of the meson. Experiments have observed that mesons are able to oscillate between their matter and antimatter states, which have ever so slightly different masses. This is because mesons exist in a state of mixing. They are a mixture of their matter and antimatter states, which allows them to oscillate back and forth between those states. As the oscillations take place, the wave functions of the two states can interfere with one another, a bit like the constructive-destructive interference of light in the famous double-slit experiment. The time to decay depends strongly on the masses of the quantum states and the amount of interference between them, which results in a characteristic pattern of CP violation in the meson decays. These measurements are interpreted within our fundamental theory of particle physics, the standard model, improving the precision with which we can determine the difference between the behavior of matter and antimatter, said Parkas. Through more precise measurements, large improvements have been made in our knowledge. The LHCB team was able to measure these properties with unprecedented accuracy. Although the decay of mesons will not fully answer why there is more matter than antimatter in the universe, understanding the symmetry-breaking CP violation at the heart of their decays will help constrain models that do attempt to explain this strange asymmetry which acted in force at the beginning of time to create a universe dominated by matter. That's all the information that we have for you today. Don't forget to give us a thumbs up if you enjoyed today's episode, subscribe if you haven't already, and hit the bell so you never miss out on future episodes. And be sure to also tell us what you think about today's content. Everyone's support motivates us to continue delivering quality content and to always improve. As always, thanks for watching, and we will see you next time.